Hey everyone, welcome to Frankfurt, Kentucky's capital city. When the French formally joined the Americans as allies during the American Revolution in 1778, Kentuckians started adopting names of French origin for some of their counties, cities, and towns in honor of America's oldest ally, France. Fayette and Bourbon counties, Versailles, Paris, and Louisville were all named between 1778 in 1792, the year Kentucky achieved statehood. Cultivating its French connection was for Kentucky a way to challenge, if not reverse, the narrative of patriotism coming from the East Coast. People here had been dealing with the French for more than 100 years prior to the signing of the Treaty of Alliance in 1778. In 1824, the news of Lafayette's return visit to the United States resonated throughout the Commonwealth of Kentucky as one last chance to physically welcome a representative of the American Revolution to the Bluegrass State. So today we're going to see what Lafayette's visit meant for Kentuckians by focusing primarily on this time here in Frankfurt on May the 14th, 1825. So we've got some answers to figure out. Let us waste no time. Let us hit the trail. Let's follow the Frenchman. November the 1st, 1824, the governor of Kentucky, Governor Joseph Deshaies, circulated a message with the help of the newspapers across the Commonwealth of Kentucky about Lafayette, about the meaning of Lafayette's return visit to the U.S. And I think he had in mind to incentivize the state legislature to extend an invitation to Lafayette to visit Kentucky. So it took two weeks for the state legislature to get this processed and by November the 17th Lafayette had been officially invited to visit. Now what I think is very powerful in the message that the governor wrote is the words that he used. So he opposes the new world and the old world. Now usually when I hear this I always think of opposing Europe to the United States old and young but that's not really what he meant at all. He was opposing the 13 colonies, the old world of the United States, versus the new states that have popped out from wilderness since the American Revolution. And he was assigning Lafayette the function of uniting the geography of the country, the old 13 colonies and the new states like Kentucky. So he uses the nature like the Allegheny Mountains that separate the two parts of the United States at the time and really he describes the American Revolution as this patriotic force, powerful enough to unite what nature separated. So to me, it, it's very powerful that he assigns Lafayette this function. And I think it was very important for people here to express a connection with the older 13 colonies, like Virginia, for instance. It was very common for people here to write poems um, referring to Lafayette as the guest of the nation or the hero of Yorktown to make that connection a clear. And so today I do want to show you what he did when he was here. So he had come from Shelbyville when he had spent the night of May the 13th, 1825. And the next day on May the 14th, 1825, he was finally received in Frankfurt. So I'm going to show you the three sites where he went. We're going to go to the public square, the old state capitol. We're going to go to see Daniel Weisiger's home and finally uh, Liberty Hall, the home of uh, John and Margaretta Brown. Uh, John Brown is very significant in Kentucky because he introduced uh, the bill as a U.S. representative for the statehood of Kentucky and later he became U.S. Senator uh, for Kentucky as well. So I do want to show you these sites now, so let's go see uh, what there is here today. This is the site of Daniel Weisiger's Tavern at the northeast corner of Anne and Main Streets. And this is actually here that when Lafayette arrived to Frankfurt on May the 14th, 1825, he was welcomed here by the governor and he responded to the governor from this specific spot. Now, why did Lafayette 
go here? Why was he addressed at a private home by the governor? So that caught my attention. And the reason is because in 1824, the State House had caught fire and had been severely damaged. So it was not available to welcome Lafayette. And what's interesting is Daniel Weisiger, a prominent individual here in Frankfurt, volunteered to help the state with the state affairs by letting them use some of his buildings, like here, the tavern. So when time came for Lafayette to be received here in Frankfurt, uh, that's here that he was received by the governor. And later on, in the evening of May the 14th, 1825, a ball also took place in honor of Lafayette, a magnificent ball that had been advertised for weeks. So it's a private home, but in that individual meant a lot for Frankfurt, and he came through Mr. Weisiger to help the city and the state, frankly, to welcome Lafayette when he was here. This is a public square, so this is where Lafayette was uh, honored with a dinner. So as you can imagine, it's a very inviting space, it's very spacious, so you could feel a lot of people here. That's where Lafayette had a dinner. And so the state house that we have here uh, would have been in tatters at the time Lafayette was here because it had been the victim of a fire the year prior. So they had a dinner in front of a, an official state building that had been damaged the year prior. After the dinner was finished on the public square, Lafayette went back to Weisiger's Tavern where he was uh, treated with a fantastic ball. And from there, he paid a visit to honor Margareta Brown at Liberty Hall. And uh, that's where we're going next. I'm arriving at Liberty Hall. This is actually the house where Lafayette went to see Margaret Brown. So I'm going to get together with the executive director of uh, Liberty Hall Historic Site, Sarah Elliott, and just find out a little more about what he did here and why Liberty Hall decided to join the Lafayette Trail. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Thank you very much. Hi. What did Lafayette do when he came to Liberty Hall? Well, Lafayette's visit to uh, Frankfurt, to Liberty Hall specifically, was a big uh, high point in the Brown family history. So when the uh, board found out about the trail, they wanted to participate and honor that visit uh, by being part of the Lafayette Trail. Can you tell us a little more about the Brown's family's connection to France? John Brown's brother, James, was appointed ambassador to France uh, and in 1824. And in that position, he was able to help facilitate Lafayette's visit back to the United States in 1824 and 25. Margareta, John's wife, wrote a letter to her mother uh, explaining about Lafayette's visit. And um, evidently Lafayette did know, at least know of Margareta, because when she went to the receiving line uh, for the women who weren't going to the dinner, uh, he took a long time to talk to her, more than he did with the other ladies. And so that indicates to me that there was some familiarity. Uh, but later on in the evening, he came to visit and she said that he stayed about an hour and that they chatted about various things. And she was quite proud of the fact that he sought her out and spent that much time with her. How do you relate to the fact that John's brother was the one that handed over the letter signed by President Monroe officially invited Lafayette to return to the U.S. in 1824? When uh, Congress decided to invite Lafayette to back to the United States, that was about the same time that James Brown was appointed ambassador. And so they asked him to submit the letter or to hand over the letter. And uh, because he was well respected, he was kind of the emissary that uh, produced the, um, the invitation. Why are there so many French names for counties, towns, and cities in the Commonwealth? Most of the people who settled in Kentucky were veterans. The men were veterans of the American Revolution. And like almost all Americans at the time, they were very grateful for uh, King Louis XVI and Lafayette's uh, help during the Revolution. And so they wanted to honor them by naming places like Louisville or Fayette County or Bourbon County after uh, the King, the Bourbon family, and Lafayette. So Americans were enslaved uh, in the building called Liberty Hall. 
how does Lafayette's abolitionist background speak to this moral conundrum? Does it add anything in particular? Does it, is it going to help you, the staff here at Liberty Hall, to talk about slavery? The fact that you can also bring his background as an abolitionist into your interpretation? Well, we don't know how Margareta and John reacted to Lafayette's abolitionist thoughts. Uh, we know that Margareta uh, considered slavery a monster. That's what she called it, the monster slavery. But John was in favor of gradual emancipation rather than the absolute aboli abolition of the, of the institution. So, and the Browns are very, um, interesting, contrary kind of family because they had sons that fought for the Union during the Civil War, even though they were slaveholders. So it's a very, um, it is a conundrum. Uh, we don't really understand how someone who fought for freedom, for uh, liberty, for every, well, for men at that time, uh, how they could hold people in bondage. The state legislature was very much aware of the historic nature of Lafayette's visit and it sought to preserve the patriotic feelings surrounding the Frenchman's visit for the enjoyment and education of future generations. On January the 12th, 1825, the state legislature passed a bill to hire Kentucky artist Matthew Jewett, the son of Revolutionary War Jack Jewett, for the realization of a full-size painting of Lafayette, arguing that Every citizen of Kentucky is eager to look at Lafayette. Furthermore, the bill commanded that the painting be placed inside Representatives Hall, which is now the Allstate Capitol. So I do want to show you the painting. Let's go let's take a look inside, see what it looks like today. Hello, welcome. Good morning. Hi, I'm Julian. I'm Nice to meet you. How are you? Thank you for having us. the House of Representatives. Uh, it was the lower house of the uh, Kentucky General Assembly. And of course, here on the wall, we have uh, the painting of General Lafayette. I'm Carol, thank you for having us in Representatives Hall. I can see Lafayette's painting right there. Very special to be here, thank you. Um, so my first question for you will be, why was it important for Kentuckians through the state legislature to honor Lafayette's visit with a painting? Well, I think that um, the, the governor of Kentucky and, and, and the, the leaders of Kentucky at the time recognized the inspiration that he could provide um, to Kentuckians. The, um, the revolutionary generation of which Lafayette was a part, um, many of them were getting much older and beginning to pass away, and I think that they wanted to hold on to some of those early revolutionary ideals that had helped um, inspire the nation's founding um, uh, as well as Kentucky's founding. Who was Matthew Jewett, the artist that painted Lafayette here? Uh, Matthew Harris Jewett was kind of the preeminent portrait painter um, in Kentucky and really the, the whole frontier uh, region at the time. Now my understanding is that um, Jewett, when he went to Washington um, to try and meet Lafayette for him to sit there, um, unfortunately missed him. Uh, he'd already started his journey. And, um, uh, uh, but Lafayette, he, he learned of the, uh, that the Kentucky wanted to have a portrait of him and he was amenable to that. And so left instructions, uh, there, was a cap there was a portrait of Lafayette hanging in the U.S. Capitol at the time. And, um, and so Jewett um, worked from, from that portrait to begin with. And then when Lafayette was in Kentucky, he did sit for Jewett in his uh, studio in Lexington so that he could complete uh, the details of his face and all. How does Kentucky today ensure that people see Lafayette? It's part of uh, Kentucky's uh, curriculum that all, uh, all students have to learn about Kentucky's history. And so um, every year we have thousands of students who come um, and visit this space uh, and talk about um, the laws that were passed here and also um, the people that we see represented here, including Lafayette. 
One of the themes that I like to talk about in particular is Lafayette's capacity to bring Americans together. He did that in 1824 amidst deep partisan divisions. Do you think he still has the same potential today with people talking about his legacy, what he stood for? Do you think that can contribute to unifying the country, bringing Americans together today? So today, I think that Lafayette's um, legacy can really be uh, to remind us of those, um, the revolutionary ideals that brought us together at the nation's founding to fight for um, equality, representative government, democracy. Um, and so I think it's important that we continue to talk about him today. Versailles. Oh, come on, GPS. Even I know that this is not how you pronounce this town's name. Really. When the design for the new governor's executive mansion was adopted in the early 1900s, I think Kentucky made a conscious decision to exercise its French background instead of following the tradition of American designs adopted elsewhere in the country, almost as a way to elevate itself above the rest of the states that didn't necessarily have a French connection to claim at all. King Louis XIV, when he was a child, survived an event called the Fronde that really traumatized him and had him move his executive seat from the core of Paris, basically out of the city in Versailles, right? So in the history of France, there has always been this divide between the ruler that's sent from, by God to France and the people that he governs over. And the design shows that, the design, the fanciness of Versailles shows that, well, in America, there is not this divide between the people and the leader. The leader, the executive official, the top executive official of Kentucky is elected not by God, but by the people of Kentucky. So the design of the house is supposed to reflect that. And somehow in Kentucky, the design of the exterior of the governor's mansion is taken uh, directly from the architecture of the Petit Trianon, Marie Antoinette's estate. I think there's a, an interesting irony of history here. So what have we learned today? Kentucky swooned over Lafayette to honor the spirit of the American Revolution. Kentucky was able to produce its own talents like Matt Jewett to preserve its history through the arts. Lafayette's legacy is useful to the staff at Liberty Hall to talk about the lives of the Browns. And Kentucky cultivated its French connection by giving French names to some of its new localities. In fact, Kentucky did not even stop there. It continued to use French names and Lafayette's name for some of its new localities. I'll give you two examples, both of which were named after the tour of 1825, Lafayette, Kentucky, and Lagrange, Kentucky, named after Lafayette's Parisian castle of Lagrange. Even more recently, the exterior design of the governor's executive mansion was directly inspired in the early 1900s from the architecture of Marie Antoinette's Petit Trianon in Versailles, in France. Speaking of uh, Versailles, the next stop on the Lafayette Trail, once Lafayette had left Frankfurt in the morning of May the 15th, 1825, was Versailles, Kentucky. That's it for us today in Frankfurt. I want to thank you for following the Frenchman to the Bluegrass State and its capital city, Frankfurt. I'll see you on the trail very soon. Thank you for watching. A bientôt!